Welcome back to Ray's Garage. My name is Ray Cornelia. I'd like to start by thanking everyone for all their comments, thoughts, suggestions, ideas on the last video, Whacked Out. Um, some great stuff out there, guys. I really appreciate it. Thanks, man. Um, there's a few things I'd like to mention about that video that I should have mentioned in the video. Uh, first thing, most importantly, is that my lathe was level. Um, and the bed was not twisted. Uh, I should have mentioned that. It's something I pay attention to regularly on that lathe. Uh, with temperature change, uh, the bed can twist a little bit. So uh, I use a precision level on it regularly and, and check that. Um, so the lathe was, the bed was true to the head <clears throat> and to each other. And the lathe uh, is level most of the time. Um, also, um, a lot of people mentioned that I did not mention tailstock alignment. Uh, my tailstock alignment uh, is very important to me and whenever I use my tailstock, uh, regardless of where it's on the bed, I always lock it down, take a few skim cuts and measure with the mic end to end of my part until I come up with an equal reading. Uh, and then it's zeroed out at that position. Um, I do have an older video out there of a tool uh, modeled after Mr. Pete's um, tailstock alignment. That's a tool to get you in the ballpark um, when, when uh, accuracy isn't real critical. Um, I'll use that just to, to get the part uh, close if it's not real important. Uh, but for real important stuff, you have to take skim cuts if you're using the tailstock until you get an equal reading on both ends. Uh, so my tailstock is regularly trammed uh, to the part that I'm working on. So I wanted to mention that. Uh, a lot of people brought that up and I thank you for that. Uh, when I'm doing my videos, I get ahead of myself sometime. Uh, I try to make them interesting. I don't want them boring where you guys use them as bedtime stories. Uh, and in doing that, I miss a lot of content that I wanted to relay. Uh, so I'm sorry for that and I'll try to get as much information in the video that I can with and keep it interesting without making it boring. So uh, today's video is a little different. Um, I have to give special thanks to a few people. One, a very popular YouTube contributor and a new, uh, YouTube commenter and watcher. Uh, so we're going to take a, a short road trip and uh, shoot some video in another location. So anyway, uh, thanks again. Uh, Whacked Out was a very good video. Uh, a lot of positive stuff. A lot of stuff I learned. Um, everyone's got a different, sometimes better way of doing something and I'm always open to that, so thank you. Anyway, uh, let's, get, uh, let's get wrapped up and uh, I'll start filming when we get to our next location. As you can see, we're not in Ray's Garage anymore. We're over here at Vico Technologies, where Philip works as a machinist. And the reason we're over here is I have an interesting story about this surface plate. Uh, it was the week of New Year, I believe. I got an email message from a gentleman by the name of Mark Rowland. Uh, he's a YouTube viewer. And uh, he has a uh, little home machine shop in the Bay Area and he was moving, so he had this surface plate he had to get rid of. So uh, he asked Tom if he'd think I'd be interested in it, and Tom said, sure, I, I believe he would be. So uh, he sent me an email message and asked if I was interested in this two foot by three foot, four inch thick uh, granite surface plate. And I said, yeah, I am. So he said, the only catch is, um, I gotta be out of my shop by tomorrow afternoon at like four or five o'clock. I had just come off of a two week vacation, so I told him there's no way I could get up there in time. I'd have to pass. So I got an email message a little while later from Mark, and he said, hey, uh, Tom said he'd warehouse that surface plate for you. So it'll be out of shop uh, the end of today. So I said, oh, that's great, man. Um, what a great YouTube community we're, we're in. You know, um, that's how great these guys are. So anyway, um, I got a message uh, from Tom a day later saying, hey, I got a big piece of rock up here for you. Come get it. 
So I made arrangements with Tom. Uh, so Philip and I went up there like Saturday morning uh, to visit Tom and to pick up the surface plate. So uh, we basically visited Tom, spent several hours with him, uh, checking out his shop, you know, seeing some of his projects. Uh, what else did we do, Philip? Look at that old, uh, that big boring mill. Oh yeah. Had, like a four inch wide T-slot in the table. Yeah, he took us around the neighborhood a little bit and ate some real interesting machinery. It was pretty cool. Anyway, we had a fantastic visit with Tom. Um, he warehoused this plate for us, um, and I appreciate that. And what we did, I didn't have room in my garage for it. So Philip is needing one for his job here. So we're like, hey, let's bring it down to Vico. So we brought it down here, and here it is, man. Uh, I'd like to thank you, Mark, for thinking about me. Um, this thing gets uh, used already. It's been here for a week, and uh, I think Philip's been using it all week. Uh, Tom, thank you for the visit. I had a great time. Uh, Philip had a great time, and um, I'd also like to share some of the things that Tom gave us. So let me cut, bring you in, and we'll share that. Okay, so uh, Tom asked if we had a copy of his book, and of course I didn't yet. Um, as a matter of fact, Philip and I were going to get him on Amazon, and Tom graciously gave Phil and I both an autographed copy of Metalworking Doing It Better. And I'll tell you what, I gotta be honest, I'm not really much of a book reader. Uh, it's hard to keep my attention when I'm reading books. But this book, I, I start reading it when I got home and I couldn't put the damn thing down. So anyway, Tom, you did a great job in this book. If you guys don't have this book, go on there and get it, man. It's chalk packed full of great stuff. I mean, he's even got a section in here removing metal splinters out of your finger. I mean, what more could you ask for? Anyway, uh, Tom was starting to show me stuff in the shop, and I'm not sure if you know, but I need cheaters for reading small print. And Tom goes, here, I got a pair for you. Take, Try these out. So I got to be honest with you. I know Randy Richard did a whole thing on safety glasses last week, and I cannot get used to the bifocals. I just can't do it. Um, and I like full magnification on the entire lens. Well, Tom gave me these things, and I'll tell you what, they're made, they're made by uh, Par Paramex, and these are the Emerge. They make them in a 150 power and a 2.0. And these things are fantastic. These are the best cheaters I've had. Tom, thank you for these, man, because I had to go run out and get another pair of these as a backup. Um, they're a full magnification lens, and you can also see distance with these if you have to, where cheaters you have the magnification, then you have to look through a clear lens. I can never get used to that. These things are great, man. I love them. Anyway, um, they're uh, Pyramex Emerge. Uh, these are the black frame, uh, clear full magnification lens. Um, I found them on eBay for under 10 bucks with free shipping. I seen them on uh, Safety Glasses USA. But there you go, man. Tom, thanks for turning me on to these things. They're the best cheaters I've had. I can't take them off when I'm in the shop. They're great. I mean, other safety glasses, I'm putting them on and off. Not these, man. These, I put them on and they stay on. So give them a try, guys. Anyway, um, let's cut. Philip would like to thank Tom and share some of his swag as well. All right, well, Ray wasn't the only one that got a book, which actually is really, really, really cool. He wrote us a little something. Each, he wrote us a little something in there, but... It was kind of, uh, I don't know, I was taken back a little bit because he said, you guys have my book. And I was like, I wish, you know. And he says, hang on for a second. And he comes back down and basically gives us the book. And it's like kind of one of those things. It's like I've wanted to get my hands on one of these since I've been reading the Cutting Tool Engineering magazines that we get uh, here at my work. And pretty much everything that's in the, the Cutting Tool Engineering every month, the articles that come out, come from this book so it's uh you know i don't have to read those magazines no more thanks tom this is uh this is really 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 cool i mean i didn't really know what to say i mean thank you this is really cool um i've already read kind of 
most of the way through. There's my bookmark. Most of the way through, I'm kind of in the CNC stuff just because, you know, give me a kind of a leg up on what I'm doing over here. And so far, the little tips and tricks and all that cool stuff that you get from this book have actually helped quite a bit. Hey, Phil, let me share a little story with everyone. So we're headed back to Fresno from the Bay Area, and I got this surface plate in the back of the truck. So it's top heavy. It's probably, what, 500 pounds? Yeah. We have it strapped down, and uh, Tom taught us some interesting rigging techniques, which we uh, got it strapped in there pretty secure. But still, it's a little nerve-wracking being on the freeway driving 80 miles an hour with a 500-pound top-heavy surface plate in a truck. And I'm trying to focus on the freeway. If any of you ever driven on uh, California freeways, uh, it's, it's, a, it's interesting. It sucks. Yeah. <laughs> You're taking your life in your hands. Anyway, um, so I'm driving, and Philip is already halfway through this book. <laughs> and not only is he halfway through the book, but every chapter he's like, hey, Ray, look at this. And I'm trying to drive down the freeway. I'm like, Phil, I'm driving here. He goes, yeah, but you got to see this. <laughs> so anyway, uh, like I said, man, it's it's packed full of really good stuff, man. Very, very useful uh, tricks. And uh, one of the, the little, uh, I don't know where it is in here. I'd have to find it. But it's a little, like a sign plate, basically, that you clamp into your milling vise. And allows you to, here it is. I don't know if you can really see that. But it allows you to, and I'm sure many of you have probably seen on his channel or whatever that he uses it, but you just you can index it at any angle you want very quickly uh, and relatively accurate uh, as long yeah. as your vise is trammed in square to the table. But I'm actually, I've uh, got one uh, solid modeled in SolidWorks. I'm actually in the process of uh, making one right now. I'm using a chrome rod for the roll and just regular cold rolled 1018 uh, inch and a inch and a half or inch and a quarter thick plate for the, the little table on it. And I'm actually going to be using that to finish uh, a couple jobs that I've got here for work. Yeah, look at that. Phil, you're getting your book all dirty. Oh, I know. My hands are dirty. But uh, while we're in the shop and in a lot of Tom's videos, you see this yellow piece of uh, what looks like railroad track. And I've always wanted to get my hands on a little piece of railroad track just for, you know, either an anvil or mill it and surface grind it parallel and use it as a straight edge or or anything like that and now with this big surface plate you know it, it would actually become in handy and, well i guess tom caught me eyeballing his track so he says well i've got a little extra piece uh let me send you home with some so he actually very generously try to be gentle with this uh Lop me off a piece of this, uh, I guess it's crane railing for like big gantry cranes or whatever, they, they roll on this. It's a little bit different, uh, different shape um, and obviously a little bit smaller than an actual, you know, railroad track. But it's, you know, pretty much as close as you're going to get and it's not too big. So what I'm going to do is I'll mill the top and bottom and then I'll surface grind the top and bottom parallel with each other and have a really good, um, nice big parallel or straight edge or something I could use it for and I can think of a thousand uses that this would come in handy for so thank you Tom this is actually I didn't expect that either really really cool and uh, also he was kind of like we're I don't know, messing around talking about vices and you know that's one the of the best his, material for uh, jaws that's in a one vice. of his uh, little tricks in that book that he gave us is to use uh, copper jaws on your vice your bench vice your Wilton your whatever Actually, I've got a stair here at work that uh, these actually are just a little bit too small, but I think I'm going to go ahead and make them uh, make them work. The bolt pattern will just fit. So again, thank you, Tom, for these. Uh, he just pretty much um, said, you know, they, they drilled them for another application. They didn't fit, so he had them laying around and said, take them home with you. So, Tom, I thank you. This is really, really cool. I didn't expect, you know. Anything we just basically came to come get the surface plate and kind of you know BS for a little bit, but then uh, you know we had a good time and uh, great time went home with uh, a few little goodies. A lot so. of good swag. I want to kind of move on to the uh, different topic of the inserts. Yeah, we'll uh, Philip liked to share something he ran across and uh, turned me onto it, and uh, I, I let Adam know about it, and now he wants to let everyone know about this. Yeah, it's kind of nice. Well, Sandvik Cormont, they had a deal, and I think it was an Instagram thing or whatever, and basically you go on their website, and they've got this new grade of turning insert that uh, it's a unilateral um, 
crystalline structure of the carbide or whatever. All the crystals face the same way on the cutting surfaces of these inserts. So they last longer, less wear, blah, blah, blah. Um, basically, you go on Sandvik's website, you give them some information, just basic information like um, address, phone number, all that crap, you know, and then you here, go ahead and stick it to the camera. And basically, they'll send you two inserts for free. Free shipping for everything. They just send them to you. Um, they had a list of the different inserts like WNMGs and CCTP or whatever the different ones are. Those um, basically are the ones they had left, but they, I guess it's while supplies last, so you might want to go now and do it. Um, but basically free inserts, and this is their new grade of uh, turning insert, which is the T-Max P, I guess, whatever. Anyways, so I was looking at inserts for like Kyocera, Sera Tip, three flute, inch and a half, like face mill, but it's a shouldering face mill. So I went on uh, Kyocera's website to look for inserts, and well, sure enough, first thing popped up on the webpage was two free inserts. So I went ahead and filled out the information, and you actually have your choice of insert that you want. Free shipping, free, just it took about a week, maybe less, and it popped right up. Those are the WNMG uh, 432 uh, PPCA 510. So, whatever grade that is, I don't know if you got too much choice in the matter, but hey, free inserts from Kyocera, free inserts from Sandvik Cormont, and I mean, who knows? Iscard, Seco may do the same thing. Um, I, I, would say, I would venture that they jump on the bandwagon as well. Just quickly, Go out there to all the websites, and who knows, you, you know, usually for some people, these two inserts with the six edges per insert will last you two, three years. If you, for me, it will. Yeah, you know, if you're not doing anything crazy heavy, these things will last you as long as you can make them last, and uh, you get, I believe, four, four uh, edges on those. So. Yeah, thanks for sharing that with us, Phil. Well, Phil wants to talk a little bit about his CNC machine, so we'll reset the camera and uh, go to it. All right, well, I guess Ray wanted uh, me to give you guys a little tour of uh, my other girlfriend here at work. Um, uh, it's, just, it's a regular uh, vertical CNC uh, machining center. It's an Acura BMV 1000. has a FANUC OI MC uh, controller, all FANUC uh, drivers, uh, servos, you know, all that. Just the standard, standard. Uh, it's a four axis. There's a fourth axis we keep up on top just because it's on the subplate. Uh, that's easy to use, you know, we could change its orientation, vertical, horizontal, right now it's in the horizontal mode. But, you know, it's just a standard 40 inch by 20 inch uh, table table travel uh, with, I don't know, about like 20 inches or so in the C. Uh, I don't know, you know, holds 20 tools or so, you know, it's your standard CNC machine, but it uh, it's really fun to work with. It, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's had its temper a few times uh, since I've been running it, you know, find your ways to work around the little quirks and you can make it do exactly what you want when you want it and uh, uh, give you good parts the first time so uh, uh, you want to give us a little demonstration well what we'll do is we'll go ahead and we'll uh, I've got a program set up for basically just to make a set of mounting holes for Kurt vice uh, any any type of material you want but basically it's the counterboard bolt holes for Kurt vice so you can take any material you want you throw it in there it's ready to go Two tools, and you got the counterboards and holes done, and you can pretty much right away bolt it into any curt vise. Don't you make them on a regular basis for soft fixtures? Jaws. Oh yeah, I've got soft jaws everywhere for these things. Just you know, over the over the years, maybe we'll show a few off. Maybe. Okay, sure. Yeah. yeah. All right, let me cut, and we'll come back. All right, here's a few examples of um, what you can do with soft jaws. Um, soft jaws. Well, when, when you make a like a contoured soft jaw is the best way to fix your part or to hold a part with uh, you know a lot of weird crazy intricate features maybe two sides that aren't parallel with each other or long enough to hold the part properly because basically what what I like to do especially is is you know here's just a small test piece of aluminum of the the parts I made in stainless I get material that's too thick or thicker than what the part should be so that you can mill on five sides of the part create the contour make sure it's perfect and what, but what you got to do is you now you got to get rid of all this material. And what I like to do is I like to bandsaw the majority off so it doesn't kind of like vibrate when you face it off. But you got to hold it somehow. And sometimes, you know, as you can see, some of these parts have, you know, very uh, interesting features like this guy here. And this one's for the food industry. But basically, you got your pockets. 
And, and in uh, SOLIDWORKS, you basically model the soft jaws off the model of the part that you're making so that all the shapes and sizes and all this is exact of the part that you've just made. So it holds it better than anything uh, out there. So if you can make a set of soft jaws or, you know, and it doesn't have to be as fancy. All you got to do is cut some angles in there. You could easily do some of these things on a manual machine, grabs mm -hmm. onto it, and it will, I mean, it's the safest, strongest way to create a perfect profile on the... Show the milling on the inside of that one, Phil. This one right here? Yeah, how intricate it is. Yeah, this one, it's, the part itself is actually real tricky. This one was really fun to program. A lot of different angles. There are no two sides that are parallel. And that was the trick. And as you can see, it's just, you know, crazy. But, you know, one side you've got a, a few reliefs just to kind of hold it on. And then you've got the pocket on this side because Bring of this. Bring closer to you. We'll do that because of this angle here. I can't really see what I'm doing, but you know what I mean. It it, it goes in like this. You want to you got a clearance for stuff like that, but it's easily done. Same with these two plastic pieces. I was able to do two at once, a left and a right at the same time. And these are uh, for the food industry as well. Um, and basically, they just fall right into place. This one doesn't. How did I get that in there? There it is. And that's it. So what we're going to do is we're just going to go ahead and make a set of blank jaws from a piece of uh, stock. Just 6061, T6 aluminum, you use whatever you want. You can use steel if you really wanted to. But basically we're just going to take a piece of uh, 7 inch long. I like using 7 inch long uh, pieces just because... Overhangs off the vise. It overhangs yeah. off the vise. And you can actually, what you can do is before you machine the features, you can come in with a long end mill or even just a small step, machine a step along the sides of the vise and there's your X zero for the part itself. So you can come in, touch off on the side of the jaw, reference everything off, because usually when you machine these out, they've got waste stock on the top and you can't really good, get a good datum to machine them, especially if you're gonna profile them afterwards. But we're just gonna use, what is this, inch and a quarter, a two and a half by seven inch long piece of aluminum. It's just gonna come in, counterbore, counterbore, done. You know, it takes like two minutes, if that, to produce one soft jaw side that you can use in any Kurt vise, six inch vise. Well, let's make a set of jaws, Phil. All right, well, let's get some stock cut up and we'll uh, All right. Down. Narrate while we're doing this. I can narrate? Yeah, what are we doing right now, Ray? I think we're gonna cut a piece of uh, stock. <laughs> um, well, let me, uh, let me grab my longer scale. You can explain what type of saw that is. It's a WF Wells and Sons Incorporated. That's what the label says anyway. Here. Okay, we're over here at the bandsaw. We're going to cut up a piece of that aluminum. Very nice, Phil. And that was, uh, you know, not using the correct pitch blade, but... Yeah, you made quick work of it. Saw works nice. Okay, let's move over to the, uh, the CNC. Yep. Adam must know we're videoing, Phil. He keeps sending me texts about those inserts. It's oh. pretty badass, though. Yeah. I gotta show them to you. All right, it's all deburred. What's the next step? Uh, we're gonna go ahead and load it in the machine, uh, set our offsets, uh, load our tools, and uh, pretty much set the offset to the tool height so you don't crash the tool into the part, and then uh, press go. All right, let me move the camera over to the Acura. All right, so we got it in the vise. Got it hard on the parallels. So what we're gonna come over and do is we're gonna pick up our, uh, you know, just like you normally would with a, a manual mill. With uh, got a regular steric, you know, 200 thousandths diameter edge finder in there. We're gonna come in and pick off the back edge and the, the left edge. And basically, I can change which uh, area I want to pick up when I write the program, either the center of the part 
you know, center mass, I can have it center top, upper left top, you know, I can change all that in the programs because sometimes you can't touch off where you want to. You gotta use a different datum to go off of and sometimes well, you got to use a machine surface. You can't just use a raw surface. Unless you're doing something like this where it really doesn't matter, it's not a big deal. But if you're trying to pick up, in a, pick up a hole that's on something that's already been machined or like a casting or something like that, you have to use um, a good, true datum point to go from or else you know, things can be off five thousandths and everything that you do is off five thousandths and they're not going to line up with any features that may be mm -hmm. there or that you need to have uh, in the future. So. In this instance, we're just going to pick off the left, pick off the top, and then our, we're going to set all our tool offsets on the top of the part so that it knows, you know, that's Z0, and it just goes down from there. That's how I wrote the program, and that's how we're going to do it. So. You face that first? Or? No, I don't face these because basically when you bolt them to the vise, if they're crooked, you're going to machine them out until you fit your needs anyway. So when you machine them out to fit your needs, your vise can actually be even crooked on the table. But when you machine them out, it's machining them out square to the machine so that it's pretty much perfect yeah, good with point. what you're doing and uh, you know so if you want to spend the time and you can you know face them if you want to make them look pretty but basically these sometimes uh, get used once and they go away forever because we may not get that job again or it may change and the geometry is different so sometimes these soft jaws just you know they're kind of like consumable so I don't really spend too much time facing or anything like that I just pop the two counter bores and the two holes through it and bolt it and go so Go ahead and set up the tools and uh, go from there. All right. All right, we're going to go ahead and uh, set the Z offset on these tools. You know, each Z offset is set differently for each tool because, you know, this tool is going to stick out from the tool holder more than another one. So, but you want to tell all your tools where the top of the feature is, the top of the part is, so that it doesn't just come down and smash through and doesn't know where it's at. So, what I use is a piece of mylar. I don't know if you can see that. It's just a little square of mylar, and it's. Uh, See how thick it is. So it's a one thousandth of an inch thick, exactly. So basically, when I when I touch this off, I touch the toe off, and it pinches this. It gives a slight drag. What I do is when I feel it give a slight drag, I go a thousandth down and set my Z offset, and we'll show you kind of how that works in the controller. But you know, just as a pretty much this is what we use. Come down. As you would with the manual machine, I suppose, but with you know with the CNC machine, there's no feel. You can't feel it. You could shove that end mill straight through that piece of aluminum with it not turning, and it wouldn't care. It just it would just do it. So we we'll use these uh, pieces of mylar as kind of like our little gauge. And I'm and there's so many hundreds of other ways. There's the 3D sensors. There's tool setters and presetters outside the machines. And you know, but this is how we do it here because um, it's quick and easy, and it works. So. Let me, uh, let me go ahead and get everything moved around and we'll uh, go ahead and touch that tool off. See, that's the most important part right there. Programmer, Philip Monday. Anyways, now this isn't like a CNC tutorial by any means, so I don't want to hear nobody say, you're doing it wrong, or I don't want to hear none of that crap about, I do it this way and I do it that way. You know what, you do it your way, I do it my way. This isn't a tutorial. I'm just kind of showing you how I do it. So kind of that being a put out there and as a, you know disclaimer disclaimer exactly you know this is how I do it may be different from how you do it and this isn't if you just picked up a CNC machine like okay I'm gonna do it this way and then you you know shove your spindle into your table that's no, not my fault that's not my fault I'm just liability purposes anyway so this is how I do it basically on this controller we're going to we have an offset button so we go into offset page and this houses all of our tools and there's up to 20 tools so basically I've got tool number two in the spindle and my uh, tool changer is in position tool number two, so that you know everything's everything's lined up. So what I'll do is I'll jump down to tool number two, and in order to move everything around, you have to go into the uh, manual mode. Once I'm in the manual mode, then I'm able to move the machine around to touch the tool off. Once I touch the tool off, I'll come in here, enter Z, and you hit Z. Input coordinates. It does the math for you from where. The machine home is to the tip of that tool, so it knows exactly where everything's at for that tool. I can't so, see your controller. Oh, uh, it's just a little standard. Up a little higher. Manual there pulse generator, nothing fancy, you know. Little clicky wheel. So we'll go ahead and we'll go back to the part and. Okay. We'll touch this tool off, and then we're just gonna do one tool. I got two tools to do this. We're just doing one tool because you know, it is what it is. Okay. Let me reposition. All right. Thank you. 
to see that. I can see it fine. Okay. I can't see you working your controller, but that's okay. Well, I'm just turning it negative, which you see now, right now, if I go up one, it's loose. Yeah. Down a thousand, it grabs it. So wow. it centers you right there. Now, each click of that, how far does it move? You could change it so that with this knob, each click. Oh, I see. Is ten thousandths of an inch, one thousandth of an inch, one ten thousandth of an inch. You can't see it. Click. Well, it's just a basic. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Turn it off so you don't crash the thing, and you're good. Then we'll just hit Z and hit record it. And then there's our position from home. So once that's done. So the top, so the end of that tool knows exactly where the top of that block is. Exactly. Okay. So then basically we'll come here. That's your edge finder. Just a little wiggler. Just wipe off the dried up coolant because it's like sludgy kind of. Oh, know. is it? A little bit, you know, the coolant splashes on it. And now you run that spindle at a thousand RPM and you're RPM. finding edges? Yeah. Okay. What's the diameter of your edge finder? Two hundred thousandths. Okay, so you're coming over a hundred to get right on that edge. Yes. Okay. This is exactly how we do it in the manual machine. Yeah, same thing. Except you're running the table by hand and not with a controller. Kick off right there. And we'll come up. Now, actually, I think one time I was doing this and I actually accidentally went down instead of up and blew up the edge finder it yeah, exploded yeah. so now what we'll do is we'll go did you come over your hunter i went over the hunter there doesn't for now we're ready to run the program all right okay we're um looking through the cover the bulletproof glass on the door so it's going to be a little blurry not crystal clear so whenever you're ready phil
is it. Well, there it is. The other one's just rinse and repeat, right? Yeah, and now you're, all your offsets are the same, so you just stick a new part in, make sure it's in the same, you know, roughly in the same place. Uh, it's where you touch it off. You can put a work stop or however you want to do that. And then uh, it makes the same holes on the other side, and then you just bolt them on and go. Then from there, then you make your feature or and some, sometimes it's real, it's real common that they'll just put a step on either side so it's like a built-in parallel. And if you need to, like, mill down below, you could mill into the jaws and it, uh, you know, it's like a perfect fit. There it is, the Acura CNC. Okay. Sure. Yeah. All right. Okay, there it is. So under was a minute 42 seconds to put the bolt holes in a... In, in, you know, in a soft jaw, in one of them. So, you know, real quick, you can have your own set. So, um, I guess that kind of wraps it up here. Um, Let's for, uh, do a couple stills, real quick. Yeah, stills. we're going to throw in some pictures of uh, surface plate and some things around the shop. But again, thanks, Tom, for uh, hooking us up with the books. Uh, this little piece of track here, I mean, this thing is really cool, you know. I'm going to use the hell out of it. So, and uh, what was it? Uh, Mark Rowland. Thanks for the plate or for giving it to Ray, and then Ray gives it back to me. So however that works. It came from somebody, so. All right, let's get some sills and uh, we'll put them on the tail end of this thing. Thanks for showing off your machine, Phil. Yeah, anytime.